On behalf of the Louisiana Center for the Book in the State Library of Louisiana, thank you for joining us for this virtual 2021 Louisiana Book Festival presentation. This program is Mirth and Murder in Louisiana, sponsored by BritBox, and featuring Ellen Byron, P.M. LaRose, and Cherie Clare. Ellen Byron's Cajun Country Mysteries have won the Agatha Award and multiple Lefty Awards for Best Humorous Mystery. She'll debut the Vintage Cookbook Mystery set in New Orleans in June 2022 and also writes the Catering Hall Mystery Series as Maria DiRico. Byron is an award-winning playwright and a non-award-winning TV writer of comedies like Wings, Just Shoot Me, and Fairly Odd Parents. Fun fact, she worked as a career waiter for Martha Stewart. Visit her at ellenbyron.com. P.M. LaRose worked for many years in the publishing industry and, unlike his protagonist, knows how to handle a computer. A native of Louisiana, he moved upriver to Minnesota before the turn of the millennium, where the concept of the Beers Detective Agency series was developed. Bayou Beers is the sixth installment, following First Case of Beers, Bet on Beers, Beers Ahead, Beers Abroad, and Beers Tapped Out. LaRose lives in Baton Rouge with his wife, Jean Ann, and a cat named Bunny. Cherie Claire is the pseudonym of Cherie Cohen, an award-winning author of a mystery series and several Louisiana romances. New this year is Ghost Fever, part of a paranormal mystery series featuring New Orleans travel writer and ghost sleuth Viola Valentine. A native of New Orleans, Cohen now lives in Georgia, where she works as a travel writer, but returns to her home state of Louisiana often. Visit ShereeClaire.net and follow her on social media. Ladies and gentlemen, Alan Byron, P.M. LaRose, and Cherie Claire. So welcome to Mirth and Murder in Louisiana. I am Cherie Cohen, your moderator, and today I'm very pleased to have two wonderful authors with me today. Alan Byron, coming to us from California, writes a fun Cajun country mystery series that takes place in a plantation along the river road that's west, northwest of New Orleans. Her Halloween theme, Murder on the Bayou Boneyard, just came out last year, which is a great title for this time of year, so go out and get it. Her latest is Cajun Kiss of Death, which come, just came out in August, and she has a new series under the pen name of Maria DiRicchio, Rico, sorry, That's okay. called The Catering Hall Mysteries. The first book is Here Comes the Body, followed by Long Island Ice Tina, on sale for 99 cents this month, another good book to grab. And her latest, the third book in the series is titled, It's Beginning to Look a Lot Like Murder, which comes out October 26. So another great book to get this time of year. Then in June of next year, Ellen's going to kick off a new series from Berkeley Prime Crime called The Vintage Cookbook Mysteries, which is set in, da-da-da, drumroll, the New Orleans Garden District. Um, and let me just tell you that Ellen loves New Orleans, so we're glad she's coming back. I'm and a Tulane, title- I'm sorry, I was going to say I'm a Tulane alum, and our daughter is a senior at Loyola. Yay, that's awesome. And the title of her first book in that new series next year will be called Bayou Book Thief. And so moving on to Phil, now should, should I call you Phil or should I call you PM? <laughs> uh, you can call me whatever. I've been called a lot of things. <laughs> Just don't call you late for dinner, right? <laughs> exactly. Or for beer. <laughs> ah, so Phil, who goes under the name PM LaRose, um, worked in tech support for a quarter of a century, he told me. And now he writes a bit character who despises computers. He insists, he told me, that computers will steal your soul if you let them. And I agree, because I'm never off of my computer. <laughs> Phil started writing 30 years too late, he told me, and he wished someone had forced him at gunpoint to start writing when he was 30. His series features a former sports writer named James Alfred Biersevich, which lends a fun title to his books. For instance, there's Beers Tapped Out, First Case of Beers, Beers Abroad. Phil believes in the importance of place to a series, and his books reflect that. They feature the same characters, but the stories are all over the map. They go from Minneapolis to Las Vegas to London to New Orleans to Iceland, which is coming out next year. And he's also venturing into new territory, writing a non-series story where the main character is going to be a homeless person. And I can't wait to hear more about that. So I thought what we could do, since you both write different mysteries, is to start off maybe clarifying for readers 
just what it is you write and maybe tell me a little bit about your series because let's start I guess with Ellen since you write um, cozy mysteries yeah and for readers who don't know what a cozy is maybe explain Um, that sure a cozy mystery is a mystery that doesn't have gratuitous sex violence or bad language and I always say um, it's not a political choice on my part it's simply because I'm not good at writing any of those Um, and uh, there are light and there's usually an amateur sleuth um, in my case, in uh, the first in the Cajun country mysteries, it's um, a, a daughter of the people who own the plantation, and she's also an artist. Um, the plantation turned B and B, which was actually inspired uh, by a stay uh, that my husband had, had about twenty years ago at Maidwood. So um, that kind of inspired. It's like, gosh, what a great location for, for a cozy mystery series. Um, And uh, both of my series are that I have just written a standalone that's more suspense that my agent is shopping, but um, the uh, cozies and the other series uh, is the catering hall mysteries, which is actually very inspired by my own life because it's set in Queens, um, where my family, much of my family lived and my character actually lives in my nonna's uh, old a house, two family house. Um, and she lives upstairs and her grandmother lives downstairs. And Marie DeRico, my pen name was my uh, late Nona's maiden name. So, oh. um, so yeah, they're both inspired tremendously by places I, I love and have a huge affection for Cajun country and new, you know, in Louisiana and New York. Awesome. So Phil, what about you? Well, um, I have a series, um, also an amateur detective. Uh, I wouldn't call it a cozy, more more of a caper, uh, because there is some um, bad language. Nothing that I put in there. It's stuck in there some kind of way. I don't know how. Um, you know, maybe I misspelled some words. Who knows? But anyway, uh, amateur detective um, who used to be a sports writer, and um, he kind of reluctantly uh, comes to being a detective. Uh, in fact, the uh, current novel, uh, Bayou Beers, which is set in New Orleans, um, he finally, it's book number six in the series, and he's finally uh, decided to hang a shingle and create a detective agency because uh, whether he believes it or not, it's something that he's good at. And the only reason he's good at it is because his cases seem to always revolve around music for some reason. And uh, he that's his real passion. He would like to be in the music business some kind of way, but he can't figure out exactly how to do it because he's not a musician. He's not, uh, he's not an instructor. He doesn't know music theory. He just knows that he likes music. And a pretty narrow niche of music, 60s and 70s rock and roll. Um, But some kind of way, uh, every case that he solves uh, comes back to his knowledge of the music. And um, so that's kind of where the sweet spot of this series is. Well, that's really interesting because, you know, you have, I guess, a music background. Is that where you got the inspiration for this character? Uh, Pretty much because um, I, I do put a lot of myself into the character in that uh, I research all the music that I'm writing about. I'm very interested in that era of music. That's what I grew up with. And I still consider it the the greatest era of music. Um, What you hear today is not really music, but uh, that's a topic for another discussion. Um, So I do a lot of research on the music. I'm, I'm finding new stuff all the time that I never heard from the 60s and 70s. And it, it, some of it is just incredible, uh, the things that I missed. So um, I'm kind of learning as I go along uh, and picking up new things uh, while enjoying writing about it that, at the same time. That's awesome. That's really cool. And Ellen, um, I understand that you worked as a cater waiter, <laughs> which is interesting for Martha Stewart. So is yes. that where you got the inspiration for your catering stories? Uh, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I did that in the early eighties and actually I'm in her book, um, her the original uh, 
editions of entertaining. There's a picture in your first book, as I she sent me a copy of the very first book, which is uh, on page 29 of all of us um, at an event in, at the Cooper Hewitt Museum, and I'm standing right next to Martha. And um, I, what inspired me to do the second series was the fact that uh, Cousins by Marriage ran two catering halls in Queens. Um, where we had oh, just ev practically every family event. And I thought, gosh, has anyone done that yet for a cozy series? And when I realized, no, I thought this is perfect. You know, and it's so personal to me, but I do find with both the um, uh, Cajun country and the catering hall mysteries that, you know, they have recipes and a lot of cozies have recipes or crafts, which is for me has been like the hardest part because I'm not a cook as my family will tell you, but and, you know, I make sure I do all the recipes uh, myself to make sure they work. And I did find myself thinking, you know, using some things I learned when I worked with Martha and um, they do an, in the first book in uh, Here Comes a the Body, they do an offsite um, uh, event. And I really went back to what it was like to, you know, to ferry um, when, you know, we go up, sometimes we would go up to her place on Turkey, on Turkey Hill Road in Westport, Connecticut, and do all the prep work. That was the cater part of Cater Waiter. And then we'd have to transport it down to Manhattan to an event there, some of the stuff. Um, so uh, I used, I absolutely rem reminded myself of how we did that and, and tapped into that experience. Wow, that must have been something. Yeah, it was great. I loved her. I have to say, in your books, you have some recipes, um, the Cajun series, and you have mofalata frittata, frittata, frittata. Yes. and cauliflower jambalaya, which I'm curious where you got those, because well, you know I know some diehard Cajuns who would go, Michelle, what? <laughs> I know, I know. Well, that was like, because that actually, that was in Fatal Cajun Festival, where one of the things is these, um, this this famous, you know, this like, you know, prodigal daughter of, of the neighborhood um, of Pelican, Louisiana, where this it's set, it goes to Hollywood to do like a, uh, you know, the voice or American Idol and wins and becomes this like pop, you know, this country star. And she comes back to town and her entourage, everyone eats a different meal, you know, they're all from LA. So there's like paleo and there's vegan. And so I had already had a jambalaya recipe in one of my books. And I thought, well, you know, it's easy. We'll just, you just, you can just to use cauliflower and rice cauliflower instead of rice. And it's also more low cal. So that's where that came mm -hmm. from. It actually is applicable to the, um, uh, to the story. And in terms of the uh, muffalata frittata, I thought, you know, all the ingredients of muffaladas are so perfect. You know, that was just kind of, I was actually really proud of myself. Uh, suddenly my lighting has changed because the sun came out here. So I'm very much partly in shadow. Um, uh, but that was actually just me going, well, you know, I can't always eat a big sandwich, but I love all those ingredients. So why not throw them into something um, where they can make themselves useful in another way? I think they're great. I think it's awesome. And uh, I love, I use cauliflower rice for lots of things for the same yeah, reason. Exactly. So, but it does and, fit uh, into the story. So it shouldn't offend. Oh, my God. That's you see my husband behind me. Um, he's <laughs> he's uh, my technical director. So, um, and it, so I did tie it into the story. So it's not just an arbitrary, you know, mm -hmm. uh, LA thing. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. And the, um, the easy jambalaya mix with the Zatarans, yeah, that's yeah. me. <laughs> oh, that's totally me. It took me forever <laughs> to come up with my own plain old time Egypt. You know, I'm not a cook, but yeah. I, I, so I really sweat those recipes. So Phil, do you have beer recipes in your book? <laughs> well, it, it's funny you mentioned that. Um, I actually did a um, okay. short story for a, uh, an anthology uh, called Cook to Death. And it was a short story with uh, my beers book characters. Um, and you had to supply a recipe at the end of it. And um, it was uh, my chicken and sausage gumbo um mm. and it the the anthology is out of minnesota where i used to live and my friend Rhonda gilliland puts that together it's called cook to death i don't uh do many recipes but i did write uh for a cookbook way back in the day when i used to work at a newspaper uh there was a cookbook called the louisiana crawfish cookbook uh by joy munger and bunny jumanville and I wrote uh, some of the uh, the copy for that. So 
Oh, that sounds great. Ooh. There's a lot of good crawfish recipes in there. Mm, I bet. That sounds wonderful. So but I don't I don't generally try to put recipes in my book because <laughs> well, you well, know, the, oh, I was just gonna say in the vintage cookbook, the one that comes out in um June, that's actually inspired by my hobby of collecting uh old vintage cookbooks. So I actually took some recipes from some of those books and kind of updated them a little. So it was actually much easier uh to do. And um, and it's really fun. And um one thing I did is I created, it's a culinary house museum and it's inspired by the Brennans and Ella Brennan and Adelaide Brennan had this great house on, um, uh, I forgot what street Coliseum, I think. And, and uh, so I kind of use a little of that as the backstory. So for my character's shop, which is called uh, Miss V's, uh, it's Geneviève Charbonnet was the woman, is, the character inspired by Ella Brennan. And um so, and it's called Miss V's uh, vintage cook, uh, ki- vintage cookbook and kitchenware shop. Mm, sounds great. Yeah. So let's talk about um, characters because uh, I know Ellen, you've got three different characters in three different series and Phil, you've got your beers man. So, you know, where do you get the ideas and how do you develop these characters? Is it part of you, little pieces of you come into this? Yes, absolutely. Little pieces of me, as I explained before, the music um, for the main character, Beers. Um, But I did work at newspapers for quite a while and observed uh, sports writers. My main character is an ex-sports writer. His best friend is still a sports writer. Um, So I kind of know how they operate and I piece together their characteristics from people I observed over the years. Um, Some of the conversations are um, actual conversations (laughs) that I've overheard. Uh, Most of them are just pure flights of fancy, Uh, but um, it's, Picking up uh, little pieces of um, personality from people I knew and people I ran into and uh, basically just uh, stealing conversations wherever I hear them. Yeah, and I bet you heard a lot of good conversations in newsrooms. (laughs) Oh, you betcha. I used to sit next to the sports department and at the advertiser in Lafayette and it was, it's pretty great. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, that's a fertile yeah. territory. <laughs> yes, and, it uh, is. Lots of weird characters. Let me tell mm-hmm. you. Oh yeah, definitely in the newspaper business. Mm-hmm. 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 So, Ellen, how about you? Where, I mean, you've got three. Well, you know, um, <laughs> uh, and I made a terrible mistake. I, uh, I, for some reason, I don't know anyone whose name begins with M except my characters, and for some reason, I named uh, my. I accidentally named my, th- my third character goes by the nickname Ricky, but as someone pointed out, cause I said, at least I did got it right with her. Cause all three of my characters have names with M. Cause as someone pointed out, uh, Ricky is short for miracle. And so there's Maggie um, in the catering uh, Cajun countries and in, in that's short for Magnolia. And there's uh, Mia, which is short for Messina in the catering hall. And there's a uh, Ricky, which is short for miracle. But on the first page of my um, here comes the body, uh, the print edition, we fixed it in the, the email edition. Um, Maggie gets out of bed, not Mia. So I don't know <laughs> how I did that and how we all missed it, but we did. Um, and so some of my, my, you know, I think my protagonists all have a, some aspect of me as like a jumping off point. And um, I did with, with Ricky, because I had the time, I did a really in-depth, I think it was called an epi guide, where I just went to town figuring it out. And, you know, and I still figure stuff out when you're writing, like an, in my revision, I added some stuff about her background, which I didn't have initially. Um, and it was great to find that. Um, and then some characters, they just come out of the air. There's a character named Cammie um, Dianopoulos in the Catering Hall series, who is her thing is she found her look in the 1980s and just stuck with it. 
and she's got frosted hair and she's you know wears like mauve and those 80s colors and she's unapologetic and she even buys her like kind of violety eyeshadow through a, a company that sells discontinued makeup and i i don't know i guess i was thinking about some of my family members and in my head they still look like they did in the 1980s because you know i haven't been around a lot of them since then because i moved to california in 1990 so i just you know came and then you really kind of try to create a, a language and a comic since we're talking about humor and, and mirth and mysteries you know you're trying to create a comic point of view for your each character so um so having someone who's unapologetically uh, uh, still in the 80s in terms of her look. And now that Mia has returned from Florida to help her dad run this uh, catering hall that he won in a bet, she's like, good, I'm coasting. So it gives you, you know, her, it's like, she never wants to work that hard. When she does, she gets things done. But, um, you know, I always try to find, uh, for especially, you know, a comic point of view for my characters. Well, that's a good, good jumping off point because this is called Mirth and Mystery our birth and murder. Murder, murder, murder. <laughs> so, you know, we, there is a lot of humor and mysteries uh, and, and a lot of series, uh, not necessarily all of them, of course, but how do you find humor? I mean, we're, we are dealing with the death of people. <laughs> so uh, how important do you think more, uh, a little humor is in, in your series? It's for me, it's absolutely the raison d'etre of my series. I mean, that's why I've been lucky enough to win three um, uh, best humorous mysteries from Left Coast Crime. But I was a television comedy writer. I wrote for shows like Wings and Just Shoot Me and Fairly Odd Parents. So that's my background. Um, you know, and, and what I always find is, is, and I tell people this, that you have to know where to put the humor. Um, I made the mistake of writing a lot of quippy dialogue around the finding of a body in my second Cajun country. And someone called me on that and said, you know, who had no sense of humor, but that's another story. I was like, well, how can they be making jokes? Someone died. And so what I learned from that was like, that was not the place for humor. So, you know, cause you don't want it to take the reader out of the story. Um, but, you know, people do respond in dire situations, sometimes with black humor, you know, dark humor, just, or just light humor to lighten up the situation. Phil, what about you? What do you think? Well, um, I mainly have my humor um, centered around uh, my comic character, Freddie, the sidekick, um, who can say anything and any, any weird notion that comes into my head can wind up in Freddie's mouth. Um, in the other areas, uh, the conversations between the main characters, while they're a little more serious, um, is more like my conversations with my friends. It's always sarcastic. It's always, you know, poking fun at them and they poke fun at each other. Um, and it's, it's kind of the way that I talk with my friends and I think most people talk with each other in a, in a joking manner. Um, even though they may be in a serious situation, it's, you know, morbid humor at times but i think uh, you need a little something to lighten up especially if you're not doing a real hard boiled you know yeah. rock'em sock'em murder mystery type thing i can't write those type of things no, um, but you either. ellen i can't i gotta have some humor i've got to have some lightness in it um and people have told me i didn't set out to intentionally write comedies um but people have told me they laugh out loud at some parts of my books and yeah. well that's great um you know i was just trying to throw a little bit of humor in there and if they laugh that's fine uh the overall tone of the books is fairly serious but i wouldn't say totally since i'm dealing with characters who are liable to say anything and do anything and uh, there's always music involved so there's a little bit of light heartedness in it um I kind of uh, try to keep the great philosopher Eric Idle in mind when I'm uh, writing these things. Uh, you know, always look on the bright side of life. Uh, <laughs> life is just absurd, and that's the final word, you know? Uh, yeah. So it's got to have a little bit of entertainment, and uh, I think comedy uh, helps add to that entertainment. 
I, I read some of these uh, Scandin a lot of Scandinavian uh, mer uh, mystery writers, and it's very dark and and gruesome and and violent, and there's hardly a laugh in the in a whole book. Uh, there are very few of them actually that have any humor involved in it. Um, I can't write like that. Yeah. <laughs> I can read it. I can appreciate it, but I can't write like that. I got. You know, the to... thing is, when you look at some of the classic mystery writers, there is always humor in their own way. Chandler or Hammett or, or Agatha Christie, I'll never forget, um, as she describes, you know, it's very dry. Uh, she described a character as having eyes the color, to, color of boiled gooseberries. And I didn't even, I looked up what a gooseberry was because it's a very British thing, but just that's such a great dry, like funny deadpan description. Um, yeah, and, and to what you're saying, Phil, is like, I don't, I can't read gory, dark, you know, it's like so much of life, especially these days is, is dark, you know, I need something for me, I'm, I think my books are an escape, and I'm, I'm a proud of that. Um, I think humor in our society, you know, get, doesn't get the respect it should, because, you know, quite often, it's a defense mechanism, just in life, you know, people like, dealing with if to survive sometimes you just develop a, a kind of a sense of humor to get you through the situation mm -hmm. you know so i think um i i remember when i was like 25 at this rare illness and you know i was in the hospital and i you know it was a very scary scary time because i didn't know what the outcome would be but i remember i like decorated my you know i had to walk around with an iv attached to one of those things that you know you pull along with you one of those stands poles you poles yeah and I was that's a simple word that I could not get in my head <laughs> and I, I gave it a name and I said oh this is my my boyfriend he said I've this this has seen more action than any, any guy I've met lately you know so I just used humor to help me deal with this you know really difficult scary situation in my life and I think that's true of a lot of people you know, I'll get a, an email from a reader who says, you know, my husband, there's this email that just broke my heart. She said, my husband of, you know, 55 years is not, is, is suffering from dementia and he's not the, you know, I'm losing the person I loved and have spent my life with and your books are an escape for me. And I get to go into that world. And I just think that's a gift. Absolutely. Ellen, I, 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 Ellen, I don't know about you, if you had a uh, a particular writer that you admired the most and wanted to try to emulate but for me it's Rex Stout oh. and um, Archie Goodwin is his is comic foil in all his novels and I've tried to uh, you know I'm nowhere near you know I'm not even one thousand thousandth that is you know talented as Rex Stout was with crafting a story but I do want to inject humor into it with the characters who are actually doing the legwork um and so that's kind of what i try to emulate uh, try to put a little archie goodwin in each of my novels yeah i made his daughter she's fascinating she would love to hear that so that's very cool, cool. yeah for me um I don't know if I'm trying to emulate any author but you know agatha christie is i i discovered her as a teenager and just read as much as I, I love it because that is the what she does is what I like to do like I would escape into that world and I felt like I was walking trotting the paths of St. Mary Mead that you know Miss Marple was trotting and um yeah, and there's so many I love to read historical mysteries they're one of my favorite cat cat uh, categories because I get transported into the those worlds and it's really you know it's fun to leave my own reality Mm -hmm. yeah well you also you know you mentioned working with sports writers phil um you know uh i worked in newsrooms for 20 years and we used to use very dark humor to get through the day because some of the news as you can imagine is, is pretty awful and some of the things we had to see and uh it's funny exactly. because um i use that in my character too she's a journalist and i'm able to it just comes out. It's just, it's yeah. humor's there. I can't help it. It's just part of the story. Yeah. Well, I, you know, in the TV writer's room, I mean, we would be there for some shows you worked hours and, and we, I, there's one show I worked the entire month of uh, entire month without a day off and midnight was an early night. And so when you're there at three o'clock in the morning and you know, it's going to be an ongoing thing, it's like you either want to, you can either weep 
or make jokes. Yeah, and if exactly. you weep, if you weep, you don't work. So nobody wants a weeper. So, you know, you learn to survive by making jokes. Yeah, absolutely. Well, in another vein, um, how important is setting in your books? Because uh, both of you, uh, Phil goes many different places. Um, and with your series, Ellen, you have um, you have one place. So how important do you find that as it relates to the murder, the storyline, the characters? You know, I just want to say for Phil's, I really enjoy, I never feel like I'm leaving his series because he brings the people with him. You know, so I, and I think that's important because even if the, the location is changing, you know, you have the people you really love and want to spend time with are there. So, and then you get to explore different locations with him. Um, so, but now I'll let you talk, but I just wanted to throw that out there regarding your it, series. No, I, I appreciate that. I, um, I intentionally uh, set out to make my series move around because um, I wanted it to be a little bit different. Most of the series that I've read, your detective is based in Boston or LA or New York and, and never moves around. But people in general move around. They go on vacation, they go on trips, uh, they go visit family, they go you know overseas. And so I wanted to make it more like these are real people and they go places at times and they just happen to come upon murder when they do. <laughs> Well, for me, setting is, I'm a setting person. I just actually was in Denver last week and doing um, some workshops for a Sisters in Crime chapter, which is an organization uh, a lot of uh, mystery writers belong to. And one of them is called The Magic of Setting. Um, I think I'm pretty much inspired by it. Like um, Cajun Country Mysteries was inspired by those wonderful old, you know, homes uh, and plantations, um, you know, with their you know, good, bad, like even their sordid history that at least those, you know, the buildings are, are part of our history. And so, um, you know, setting and, and part of the magic of writing the series has always been to really describe and, and have people feel like they're there, um, especially with the Cajun Country series in particular. And I really, and I hope through the series, and I think I have encouraged some people to visit the region and explore, you know, explore it and experience it for themselves. So it's such a, it's just such a fabulous part of this country. Um, you know, in the Catering Hall series, what's fun is that it's where it's, that's real. You know, it's not fictional. I mean, you know, my protagonist, when she's walking from the subway, it's the subway, it's what I walk to get to visit my nonna. Um, the place where she works is where my husband and I had our East Coast reception. It was run by, uh, for, um, run by family members. Uh, so setting is really crucial to me. And, and um, you know, and the garden district, when I was just in New Orleans uh, before my daughter and I had to evacuate, you know, I walked the garden district and just, just absorbed it and you know there's a specific house that uh inspired where the setting is you know and I've, I've you know of course fudged it and and fictionalized it but I'm a a big setting person I really want to transport people to the locations I write about so you again you know you both have series so um did you set out thinking I'm going to write a series or did you have a standalone idea that maybe your publisher talked you into the series or um, how did it all start? Oh, gee. Um, I set out to write a book just to see if I could. And, <laughs> and when I finished the manuscript and showed it to some people, I said, oh, yeah, that looks good. You could get that published. And I said, OK, well, let me see if I can get it published. And then I got it published. By the time I got to the end of the book, I said, I thought, actually, I leave a cliffhanger at the end of the book because I referred to what happens in the second book. Um, so I figured it would be, you know, two books at least. And then somewhere along the way during the second book, I decided, you know what, I like these characters. I think I'm going to keep writing about them and uh, so it's been that way ever since I write about a novel a year uh, Ellen it 
sounds like you write one every couple of weeks. Uh, <laughs> Hardly. <laughs> I'm not quite that fast. Um, although uh, this new project that I worked on it took me 38 days from start to finish. Wow. So wow. You, beat, you beat me on that. I've never done that. I, uh, yeah, I got inspired. It's completely different from the beer series and uh, I haven't sent it around yet. So I'm still getting people to look at it and tell me how bad it is. Uh, so we'll see. I'm sure it's great. Yeah. Well, for me, no, I set out, I knew I was writing a series. In fact, um, Plantation Shutters was the first book in the Cajun Country Mysteries. And um, when my agent went to sell it, it went out with um, three or he, I, I can't remember how many, I, I think for that first one, it was just three different story ideas uh, in addition to, or two in addition. So there'd be three and then kept, they picked up for, they kept picking up for more. Um, with the Catering Hall Mysteries, I went out, I had a three book deal and I went out, you know, with five or six stories. So now I got a, I was asked to write a fourth book. I don't know how many will go beyond that. Um, and you know, you and it becomes like they're, they become family to you. You know, you sometimes forget that they're not real. I always think of, I was joke that there's a movie magic with Anthony Hopkins, who is a ventriloquist and his dummy, you know, he kind of is a breakdown and his dummy is alive to him. So, you know, I always sometimes <laughs> feel like I'm in this weird world where I have to go, oh, wait, I, I can't visit Maggie. She doesn't exist. Pelican doesn't exist. So, um, so yeah, no. And then, you know, I pitched, uh, they were pitched as series. So how do you keep all these characters and details and places? <laughs> how do you keep oh, them all? You got to take notes. You got to you got to write out their background, their history, their birthdays. You you got to know all that stuff. Uh, my books, in particular, since I, it's it's kind of diary based. You know, every everything takes place on a particular day at a particular time, and it, it's more or less uh, the main character. Uh, narrating a chronology from day to day what what transpired on this case so um yeah i i keep voluminous notes on the characters and so far i haven't tripped over myself and and done something really stupid like saying you know he's 22 when he's really 65 or something <laughs> like that um, it may happen one day when i <laughs> get forgetful but uh, as long as I and have one of your notes. readers will point it out. Yes, yes, they'll always point out your mistakes, won't they? I yes, they do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I wish I was that organized. I'm a, a lot of it is me going back to previous books in the series, going, oh, how did I describe that? What color are his eyes? You know, and there's some searching involved. Um, you know, I, I, which is kind of a pain, but it's it's the only way I've been able to do it. And I also have um, in the front of my books now, I, I have like a cast of characters because I tend to have a lot of characters in my books. Um, so that way people can like, if you you know put it down and pick it up, they can look at the cast and, and excuse me, remind themselves who who is who. Yeah, but mostly for me, it's going back and, and looking. And, you know, a lot of it is I mean, with you, Phil, you're changing locations and stuff. So there's, yeah, it's like juggling. Um, you know, I can go back to the first book in the Cajun Country Mystery Series and see how I described uh, Crozat, you know, the manor house at Crozat and, you know, use that in the seventh book, just adapting it so it's not exactly the same. And I think I tend to have, uh, I have images, I think because I was writing for TV for so long, I'm very visual. Um, so, you know, I can envision, you know, when I think of my protagonists, I could see what they look like. Well, speaking else? of TV and film, I mean, I always, I started out in screenwriting, so we always talked about the Bible, you know, how you have a Bible when you have a TV series so yeah. that you know what's going on, which is what I use because I would be lost if I didn't take notes. <laughs> I forget what the color eyes they are. But in that vein, too, um, when you have a, a series and you're going from one book to another, uh, do you feel the need to catch up your readers? Because I know a lot of readers will say to me, at least on my series, they'll say, um, is this a standalone story or do I have to start at the beginning? And I always say, you can do either one. Um, so what do you, you know, do 
to make people uh, make a book stand alone so that you don't have to, you know. Well, I think it might be easier for Phil because he's yourself. Uh, for me, though, I it's I would say the, its analogy is like um like a castle episode, you know, where you have the case of the week, but you also have the ongoing relationships of the characters, you know, and you will find out if you pick up like Cajun Country, uh, my Cajun Kiss of Death, my most recent Cajun Country, um, you will find out things, you know, that you didn't know like that you wouldn't have known if you picked up the first book um but it's it's relationship stuff so it's not it won't ruin any of the mysteries for the case of the week that stands so they are standalone you know or you can read them in order so eventually my series is going to be published in one volume that's going to be like this thick uh, because <laughs> It starts in 1999, and I'm up to 2002 now on the sixth book. Actually, the seventh book takes place in 2002 also. So it, it all takes place over a very short period of time, and I'm constantly referring to uh, things that happened in the past. So each, each novel, I have to give a little background of the main character, and, and, and always they're always referring to things that have happened before. Uh, because it's it's in such a short time span that that it's fresh in their memories. Um, it it really helps to read them from start to finish. You don't have to. They're all standalone stories, but I'm constantly referring to uh, people from the past and you know what happened the last book. and so it it does help to to read the series in order. I do keep people, you know, if I reference something in the past, I'll give enough so that they don't go, wait, what was that? You know, uh, without giving anything away. That's important too. Um, yeah. You know, so it's a, it's a balancing act. Yep. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you have readers who develop uh, an, a, such a commitment to your characters that they want their lives to move ahead and they'll get, start to get frustrated. You know, they're like, well, when are they going to get married? you know, and are they gonna have a baby? I mean, they'll, you know, they're that committed. So I like, because I, I, you know, we're all readers, all three of us are readers, mystery readers, as well as writers. So, you know, we know what we like. And I know, I think I try to recreate that for my readers. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting that Phil, that you started in 99. Is there a reason why you went back that far? Um, I, I always wanted to start, uh, with a period, I didn't want to start with the, I wanted to be in a period where the technology wasn't so overwhelming that the main character had to conform or he just couldn't survive. Back in 90, 1999, you didn't have smartphones. Um, you didn't have iPhones, you didn't have iPods. Um, you had Walkmans, okay? That was a state of the art and of course, he was even more of a Luddite because he's only collecting LPs, eight tracks and cassette tapes. He doesn't even go for CDs. So he's, he's in the way back machine. Um, I wanted to have a character who was a little quirky in that respect and uh, who wasn't really up to date technologically. Uh, so I thought that was a more interesting era uh, a, a little simpler time, you know, when you still had uh, a landline phone in your house and um, everything wasn't so electronic that you, all you had to do was touch it and, you know, it comes on instantly. Well, that's and, a, you know, a good point. Cause I think we spend you know, books that are set in the present. We spend a lot of time trying to figure out um, how, you know, at some pivotal moment where that cell phone, how it's like, is it, you know, we get tired of like having phones be lost or, mm. you know, I, uh, or lack of reception. That's a big, I've used that one. That's a handy one. You know, yeah. suddenly mm -hmm. you're in an area where you can't get cell phone reception. Yeah. But it's real tricky writing for that era because I'm constantly having to go back and say, no, wait, was that invented then? Or did they have that yet? Yeah. Or, you know, was Google around or, you know, any of that stuff? Yeah. So they use Hotmail. Oh, um, God. I, I remember. remember that. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe yeah, I started. <laughs> I started my series in 2006, um, right after Katrina. And I have to think about it all the time. I'm like, would they have used a phone to take a picture? Because I knew they had cell phones yeah. at that time, but it's tricky. 
and I don't know about YouTube, but you ever watch an old movie with a uh, with your kids and they the people are in trouble and they're you know dangers chasing them and they're like use your cell phone. <laughs> I'm like they didn't have one. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Yeah, so, it's kind of hard to imagine that era now when we we weren't in communication every constantly. second of the day everywhere <laughs> we went. You know. Yeah. Well, it's so funny. Dangerous it's like. Time. Yeah, and it's so funny, like, and this is a bit of a side trip, but, you know, you all the stuff that you live, you use sometimes. Now, I rented a car once, and um, when my daughter was in it, and she was like seven or something at the time, and, and it was like, I had to rent it, and it was the lowest, it's all they had left, and it was bare bones, and I said to her, look, if you want to get air in the car, you're gonna have to roll down the window, and she said, how do you roll down a window? Wow. She never rolled down a window. <laughs> when he, I was like, what? And then I thought about it. It's like, yeah, you know, so, yeah. <laughs> well what's your favorite thing about writing mysteries is this something you like always wanted to do or did you write other things first well i know ellen you wrote for tv um, and plays i was a theater playwright oh, right. before i became a tv writer and freelance magazine articles i've done it all so what made you start hmm. uh writing mysteries well, I wrote what I love to read and I, I uh, you know, in TV, you can sometimes have a great run and then hit a drought when you're not working. And I hit a drought and, you know, nothing. I wasn't on staff and I, I was a little burned out anyway, but I wanted to do something. And I, I had tried writing a mystery once before I tell a story. There's a writer I'd worked with on a show that will remain nameless as will he. And I was, he backstabbed uh, me and uh, my writing partner, I actually, and I had a writing partner for TV and I wanted to kill him. So I took a, a mystery writing class and um, what I wrote wasn't very good. So I thought, well, I can't do this. And then, you know, about 10 years later, um, 10 or 11 years later, a friend started a little writer's group with just four of us. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to challenge myself. I love to read mysteries. So I'm going to challenge myself to write one. And I read um, several books on how to write them. Uh, Carolyn Wheat's book, Hallie Efron's, and kind of trained myself. Um, so, you know, I write what I, I love reading mysteries. It's my favorite form to read. So that's why I write them. Awesome. How about you, I, Phil? I have kind of a similar tale. We were living in Minnesota at the time, and it was too freaking cold to go out and have fun. So I spent a lot of time indoors reading. Um, the library was a short distance away in the Skyway from my office. So I'd walk through the Skyway, you know, keeping warm. I'm from the South, you know. Uh, I can't tolerate 10 degree weather. And um, I read. You should. I know. <laughs> That's just I wrong. Hated I hated that. I, hated I read it. voraciously, and you know, I'd I'd find an author and I'd read the whole series, John McDonald, and and you know, uh, y you name it. And and I came across Rick Stout, and and I read everything he wrote. And after I finished, I said, you know what? That guy is the best. And I've, I've read the best now, nobody else is going to measure up, unfortunately. And so I said, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to test myself. I'm just going to challenge myself to write a story, see if I can do it. And that's when I started writing and it took me five years off and on to write the first novel. Um, and then I finally finished and I looked at it and said, yes, I can do it. <laughs> and then I said, what's the next challenge okay well you know that was to try to get it published and so i did that and after that and it got published i said you know what i'm just going to keep going and i enjoyed doing it and so now i've kind of accelerated i do one a year that's you know about my output i can't go any faster than that my brain doesn't work that fast i'm old I'm real old. No, you're not. Um, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I enjoy it. It's it's a fun outlet. Uh, it lets me be creative. It lets me uh, work music into it, which I love. Um, and so I hope I'm exposing some people to some music they never heard before. Uh, and uh, so we'll see. Yeah. So if you had to give, if people are watching us right now and they're writers, what advice would you give them? 
run away. <laughs> yeah, I'm about to say, be nice. <laughs> <laughs> Start writing every day, even if it's only two words or a sentence. Write something uh, till it becomes muscle memory. Um, I, I would recommend keeping a diary as, as a start off point if you don't have an idea for writing a story. Keep a diary, and that'll, you know, things that you observe, things that you hear, funny anecdotes, stories. Um, and then one day you'll sit down to write and you'll decide that there's a story in your head that you want to get out and it happens automatically. Oh, that's really sweet. That's a nice way to put it. Yeah. I would say, um, you know what, I, there was only one period when I, a couple of times or maybe once or twice when I've gotten a little stuck, someone gave me advice and said, write 15 minutes. And, um, and anyone, you know, just go ahead and do that. Just think, just write, just spend at least 15 minutes just focused on writing. And then it becomes a half hour and then an hour and then you're back, you know, back in the saddle. And so I, I would really advise that and, and just write, um, be a sponge, absorb life, keep educating yourself. I mean, I still, you know, I've been earning my living as a writer for God over 35 years um, various forms. And I never, I still like get excited about a, a workshop or, um, you know, learning more. So be a life learner. Um, and just, yeah, right. Good advice. So what's on the horizon? I know I mentioned, uh, what's coming up for both of you, but maybe you can expound on that a little bit. Well, I'll start because uh, this book, it's beginning to look a lot like murder, which I think the title is backwards <laughs> on there, launches a week from tomorrow, officially launches. It's available for pre-sale. And um, and I'll show you, this is my uh, current uh, Cajun Country Mystery, which is available now. And books make great gifts. I realize you can buy all three of my Catering Hall, mis uh, catering hall Mysteries in paperback for under $30. So you could give someone the set. Um, which would be a very nice gift. And then I'm very excited about my vintage cookbook series, which launches on uh, June 7th, um, you know, and gives me more excuses to keep visiting New Orleans as if I don't have enough. <laughs> Excellent. Well, this is my latest, Buy You Beers. Um, this is um, the establishment of the Beers Detective Agency. Uh, in New Orleans, my characters are now firmly ensconced in New Orleans, and um, the series is going to proceed from there. It won't always be in New Orleans. It's going to move around. For example, next year's story is set in Iceland. That's great. Um, wow. And uh, also, I have the side project about the uh, homeless person, which um, is finished, and uh, it's getting a quick read by some friends who I trust and uh, hopefully they'll have some good suggestions before I send it on for uh, evaluation by an editor. So is it a mystery as well? It's uh, it's, it's somewhat of a mystery, but it's not, it's not a mystery in that I don't solve it for you. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more of a character study. Interesting. Um, and it, there's no humor in it. There's really no humor whatsoever. Didn't that find I, my standalone, which is inspired by my grandfather's on the Jewish side. I'm half Italian, half Jewish. And my gra Jewish grandfather was actually a low level mob and disappeared in 1933. And so I wrote a standalone inspired by that. And um, and yeah, it's got less humor than anything I've ever written. And it just felt so weird. Did it feel weird for you to write something that didn't have humor? yes feel? yes it was it was very unnatural yeah um, exactly. but uh it felt like a story it just poured out of me like i say i wrote it in 38 days and it just it was like i couldn't write it fast enough it was just coming out uh i don't know where it's gonna go i don't know if it's worth anything that's for somebody else to determine we'll see it sounds like it is yeah. coming out of you that fast it's got to be you know, usually that's a that's a well, winner. If you're interested, I'll I'll send you a copy and you can, you can okay. take a look. Sounds great. Cool. 
Well, we're at the top of the hour. So this is about the point where if we were sitting in Baton Rouge <laughs> in one of those house committee rooms, I know I just miss it so much. We would say, I would say, go to the book tent and buy your books. Um, but people can go online and buy them. Um, are your books available? Um, ebooks, print, both? Yeah. I take yeah. it all Online yes, bookstores. and uh, the bookseller for this, uh, uh, support your local bookstore. And oh yes, gosh, I'm, I'm blanking on the, the name of the local, the books. There is a bookseller for the Louisiana Book Festival. And and um, I, you can find the name on the site and I would really encourage you to give them the business. And remember, you know, the books make great gifts. I'll repeat that. They do very much. Absolutely. There's also, there's several independent bookstores in New Orleans and Baton Rouge. Yes. I, heard, I heard Cottonwood is going out, is being sold, which breaks my heart. But yes, I agree. Um, do, do patronize your independent bookseller. And I didn't mention my books, but they're, yes, <laughs> the, please do. they're the Viola Valentine Mysteries. And my latest, it's an ebook, comes out on Tuesday, October 26th. Oh, we launched the same this. day. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. I'm very excited. So it's the seventh in the series. So I'm wow. like, I can't believe I'm where I'm at, but time flies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. So, thanks. But any final words on, uh, for our readers and our listeners? Yeah. I'm uh, almost out of beer. So I got to, <laughs> well, I'm on Pacific time. So it's not, it's not even quite five o'clock here, although it is oh. five o'clock somewhere, which is what, where Phil is. Um, yeah. I just want to say, I, I, Thank you so much for, for watching. And I love Louisiana. I love New Orleans. And I uh, hope that when it's in person again, you'll you'll come to whatever we're doing and introduce yourselves and um, stay in touch. Oh, and we have websites. Uh, I'm yes. here at ellenbyron.com. I have a, a, a monthly newsletter that's a lot of fun. I do. I have a lot of fun with it. So you can sign up for my newsletter and get updates and contests and a secret downloads page. So at ellenbyron.com or also mariedorico.com. Phil, what about you? Uh, you can find me at pmlarose.com. I'm on Facebook at, at PM LaRose or Beers Detective Agency. Uh, on the Beers Detective Agency site, there is a lot of uh, the music that I investigate and add into my books. Uh, some of it you've never heard and you wonder why, because it's just incredible. Uh, so go check it out and sounds great. Keep reading. Thanks. Yes. Sherry, what about you? What's your website? Uh, it's sherryclaire.net and you can sign up for my newsletter and I'm all over social media and I just got on TikTok. Ah! Oh! <laughs> yeah. I heard book talk is really hot. So I'm trying it out, but it's not me at all. <laughs> I'm I not, <laughs> I'm kind of shy. A... So I'm trying my best to work I, on I that. Absolutely Anyway, well, thank you both. It's been so much fun. Well, thank, thank you. you. Um, I hope we get great. to do this in person next year. Let's hope. Yay. Yeah. So nice. thanks a lot. All right. Thanks. Good and seeing thanks, you. And you thank too. you, Louisiana Book Festival, for uh, yes. for supporting uh, the, the written word in, in Louisiana. Bless you for that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Thank you for watching Mirth and Murder in Louisiana, sponsored by BritBox, a presentation of the virtual 2021 Louisiana Book Festival. Please visit our official bookseller, Cavalier House Books, and receive 20% off all featured festival titles through the end of the year. A special thank you to our festival sponsors. The Louisiana Book Festival will return on October 29th. 2022.